<laughs> We've got two goals for this 30-minute conversation. First, we want to inspire you. And second, we want to give you the tools to achieve what DJ has achieved. Um, I'm Eric Dreyer. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction, Patrick. Uh, I joined Kanji in 2021 after about two decades of being an independent author, trainer, consultant. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here again and happy to introduce you to DJ. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Danielle, but I'm known as DJ um, in my little network. Um, so just to introduce myself, so um, I have had a career in technology spanning over 20 years now. I started my career with Apple. Um, and I worked very various different roles at Apple, um, uh, doing lots of roles in Apple professional services, which gave me great experience working with businesses across uh, Europe, uh, adopting uh, Apple device management, um, and everything that comes into that as well. Um, I then went on to uh, start my own business. So I ran my own business for several years. Um, it was called Danny Mac, a little play on my name, Danielle, Danny Mac. <laughs> um, and I ran that for several years. Um, I had a lot of clients in broadcast um, and film, uh, a lot of clients in Soho in London. Um, I don't know if, you, if anybody in your audience remembers Xan, but I spent a lot of time in sand storage, Xserves, Xserv X-rays, um, had a wonderful time. It was a great time then. Um, and then uh, I come, kind of came back into employment. So I worked for Sotheby's um, and really started getting into device management. Um, I left Sotheby's and worked for Jigsaw 24, reseller. Um, and uh, I then worked for EasyJet, so spent some time in the airline industry, again around device management, iOS, uh, devices for cabin crew and pilots, super interesting. Um, and then joined WPP, uh, the company that I work for today, who's a creative uh, advertising company. Let's set the stage for uh, WPP. Uh, WPP. Um, I'm going to try to show a quick two-minute video from uh, the WPP website. Uh, so let's see if we can do this. Full screen. Super cool. <laughs> Danielle, yes. what was, when you came to, to WPP, what were some of the challenges that you were 
up against? Yeah, so I joined WPP as a solutions architect and uh, coming into WPP, so that was three years ago, um, WPP were immersed in a transformation journey. Um, and they didn't quite know what that was looking like. Um, just to give you some context, probably they've been running a program three or four years prior to me coming into the business, uh, looking at how they could transform some of their tooling, looking at their uh, device estate and those capabilities and features that their users wanted, um, and also looking at you know, our business operations, the kind of business architecture that kind of surrounds those solutions and tooling in, in a business. So I kind of joined then, and so the objectives I was given was to look at the current tooling in the business. Um, uh, our MDM tooling at the time was on-premise, and so the desire was to get off of on-premise and get into cloud, digital first. Um, also to look at tooling around laps, um, administration processes, um, you know, how do we acquire uh, applications and deploy them, you know, at speed? Um, the ever-growing kind of requirements and uh, pushes and needs of, of WPP. So I should mention WPP is very fragmented, right? Um, they uh, are a global company um, with over 300 opcos and agencies. So it's very fragmented and diverse. And everybody has different requirements, different needs, different builds, uh, different uh, attitudes and behaviors, should I say, as well, you know, especially when it comes to admin access and those kind of things. <laughs> so it was a lot for us to look at, right? Um, and I think that's where we kind of st started at, was kind of let's look at those challenges, let's look at the pain points, and also invite, you know, uh, some of our operating comp uh, companies and stakeholders that had voices in, the, in this area, you know, that were surfacing up those challenges and pain points um, uh, in their technology stacks and, and uh, you know, their devices, right? We're a creative company and we've got very creative minds um, and a lot of our creatives use Apple, right, as their choice of devices. And so for them, you know, using their device at home versus using a device at work was very, very different. So that was a, a lot of the challenges that were coming through to me. Do you have a concrete example of a challenge and like getting a device into someone's hands. Yeah, so just um, for example, you know, uh, one of the objectives I was met with uh, from the business was to shorten the time uh, of getting a device to a user. And so that statement in, on its own was like, well, okay, what? So I had to get into the context of that and, and speaking to stakeholders around the globe very different narratives, you know, some stakeholders were coming, out, coming forward and saying, you know, Danielle, it takes us two to three months to get a device to a user. Um, so it was very clear that the whole turnaround of devices in the business was, was very challenged and broken, and that was something that we immediately, you know, one of our first focal points to look at. Do you want to talk about how you went about sharing your vision for what could be? Yeah, I mean, <sighs> How you it's, built your team. It's a really difficult one. You know, you go into a business and you identify those challenges and those pain points. And then you start to build up a bit of a vision, right? You pull from your experience of your career and where you've worked and the tooling, what works, what doesn't work, uh, building on those challenges and experiences that you've solutionized before. Um, and so I think for me, what helped was building that vision with my stakeholders. Um, and that was really challenging as well, you know, finding those right people along the journey to share, to share who, that vision. Who were the stakeholders? Yeah, interesting question. You, you, you know, you think you uh, know the stakeholders, right, that you want to kind of target and bring on board. But not every stakeholder wants to be on board for various different reasons. Maybe they're not really interested in the technology or they don't have that trust in IT. You know, you're always the, you know, the pain givers, so to speak, so there's not a trustful relationship there. So I did find uh, along my journey that some of the stakeholders that I tried to bring on on the journey maybe weren't the right people, so then I tried to target other stakeholders stakeholders, should I say. I made them my stakeholders. Um, and why? Because, you know, I needed them to come along that journey with the vision, right, and have some, some stake in what we're trying to do. 
um, and carve out those objectives and requirements. Can you talk a little bit about how you shared the vision of where you wanted to go and did that align with what, where they wanted to go and kind of to get them to go where you wanted to go and did where you wanted to go change based on where they needed to go? Yeah, I mean, as I've explained, it's, it, you know, it's a very fragmented company and uh, never worked in, in any kind of company or gig before, like, like WPP, where they have all the challenges. And as I explained, there's, there's multiple, so many opcos and agencies. So as you can imagine, everybody has a bit of a different narrative. So that kind of spans very different requirements and objectives and challenges and pain points as well. And, um, and what I quickly started to learn was it's not just about the behaviours and patterns of a, a certain opco, you know, it's who they deal with as well. So some of their contracts with customers determine that they have to work on certain tooling or, you know, work in a different way or different workflows. So for example, not everyone had Apple Business Manager, right? Correct. Yes, that, that was a huge challenge for us as well. Um, as I said, we span global. So, you know, we have some markets, certainly some, some opcos that sit uh, in some kind of remote areas that, you know, Apple doesn't have ABM presence there, for example. And so those were challenges as well of getting under the hood of why somebody buys from the Mac Shack down the road, right? The Mac Shack? <laughs> yeah. Just to get their devices, right? Because they're so remote and they're not under Apple's coverage, they can't stop ABM, for example. So, so yeah, there was, there's a lot of challenges. So those are organizational challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you personally have experienced throughout your career? Yes, so um, for me, being a woman in tech, and just looking around the room right now, I don't see a lot of women here, um, that's been my, one of my biggest challenges throughout my career, I have to say. Um, there's been a lot of bias and challenging roles that I've, I've had, you know, not being able to feel authentic in the room, not being heard or seen because I'm a woman. Um, and it's sad to say that, but it does exist. Um, and so I found that really challenging sometimes to be able to kind of be heard, you know, and put my thoughts and my experiences and uh, my visions across. And why is it important for you to be on the stage here today to, to share your story? I think... You know, I'm really passionate about what I do in technology, and as a woman in tech, you know, I hope my presence of being on stage today resonates with somebody. Um, I personally would like to see more women in tech and encourage more women uh, to be in technology. Um, I feel like it's changing, but, you know, w there's still more to be done. Um, and uh, just that whole, yeah the whole challenge, I guess, of being a woman in, in technology. Certainly along my, my career, I've suffered with imposter syndrome, you know, um, and looking for role models along my, my career path, which has been very challenging, like I say, you know, I was very often in my employments, my gigs, previous gigs, and only being the only woman in that technology department. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to identify or, you know, or align yourself with a role model to help in your career. We talked about uh, one of the, I'm just going to go to the next slide, about AKQ, AKQA. Tell yes. Me, tell me about. Yes, so uh, AQ, AKQA is uh, one of the opcos of uh, WPP, and they recently acquired uh, a company called uh, Pink Chip. Um, and I wanted to just kind of bring this to this forum because um, Pink Chip. Uh, is a company um, that look into uh, CEOs of women and investors and uh, looking at that bias, you know, amongst women um, in the... Do you want to play the... In, yeah. Should we play the video? <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is just a, a quick two-minute video uh, that encapsulates uh, their story. Female leaders are better for business, but still, the market doesn't like them. Today, just 7% of the world's CEOs are women. 
and where they are appointed, investors sell their shares. The short-term reactions are probably based on some kind of bias. This bias is not only bad for society, it's bad for bottom lines. And if there's one thing the male-dominated investment world dislikes more than women, it's missing out on profits. To reverse the bias, Dihiro, Europe's largest investment app developed, Pink Chip, the first live index to track the performance of women-led businesses and reframe market bias as a missed investment opportunity. Using AI software, Pink Chip assembled a first-of-its-kind open data set of female-led companies and measured their performance against global benchmarks. Backdated up to four years, it makes the success of female leaders impossible to ignore. Unveiled at the world's oldest stock exchange, Pink Chip went live on International Women's Day. Investing in women is not only the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. And on the same day, announced a partnership with UN Women. Pink Chip is now just a subjective initiative. It is backed by data, something crucial in the investment world. Pink Chip is a turning point. Yeah, Pink Chip as an investment, yeah, I think. Leadership needs to outperform it. As news of Pink Chip spread, the market took notice, crashing the DeHero app in the process. Pink Chip is much more than an index. Important contribution for scholars and for researchers. Women must be seen as an economic force. An advisory board has been established across five countries. Demand for more indices and app integration from global platforms and investors has surged. And to date, the Pink Chip Index has outperformed competitors and continues to climb. By reframing this moral failure as a financial one, we can convince the world to invest in proof, not bias. Super powerful. Yes, quite a powerful message there. Um, and here we have some data, right? That can't be argued with. Insights. Let's talk, let's come back to your most recent experience, your most recent challenge. Can you talk about how you evaluated tools and partners? Yeah, so um, coming into WPP, as I talked about, you know, their vision and they wanted to transform uh, transformation and moving off of various tooling and getting into cloud tooling, etc. So one of the things that I immediately did was the due diligence part, right? To go out to market and look at all the vendors, the tooling, uh, anything new, um, trends, insights, new stuff coming through. Um, and we took that back to WPP. And then we looked at five different vendors uh, for our MDM tooling. Um, and we took them through a, quite a vigorous uh, proof of concept um, we involved around uh, 500 users around the business to be able to participate in that proof of concept also um, to give us that valid feedback as well. I think, you know, we kind of had our objectives and requirements list kind of, you know, <laughs> grows and <laughs> grows, um, but really kind of those top level objectives and uh, the requirements were agreed uh, for uh, uh, enterprise technology. Um, but we did a lot of work with our users to be able to give that feedback as well because of the requirements span vastly across those opcos. We wanted to give an opportunity to those users to be able to you know, work and do their various workflows that we, we couldn't kind of capture in requirements, if you like, um, to then give us a, that feedback on, on the tooling. Awesome. Moving thousands or tens of thousands of devices from one MDM to another is challenging. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about how you approached such a massive move? Yes, um, it was very challenging. And um, we had various different challenges along the way. And I think, you know, as, as much as you plan, you have to be agile, right? You know, and really it was more about a strategy. Um, and I think the strategy that we came up with was obviously we were going to phase this out. There was never going to be a big bang of, of migrating our devices. Um, and every phase that we went through, we learned a little bit more, right? Uh, another challenge, another requirement, for example. And so that's when I talk about that, you know, being agile, we really had to uh, have that agility around the strategy 
slash plan, if you like. Um, and so we use that phased approach, you know, lots of comms, lots of um, sharing, um, standing up collaboration tools like Teams channels and things like that, uh, email resolver groups so that our users could quickly get help if they needed to. Um, and also for the business to understand, you know, what we were doing, right? And the vision of where we were trying to get to because also you need that buying from your users as well, right? Part of that migration process for us, there was a little bit of an onus on our users to be able to press some buttons and, and flow through a process. So, you know, we, we spent time nurturing and making sure that whole process for our users was really quick, simplistic, you know, they didn't really need to know what was going on under the hood, right? But we needed them to just flow through on a process for us in, in terms of that migration. And I have to say, the first few phrases, we learned a lot. And then we were able to kind of really push the, our foot down on, on that migration process. Um, and we were able to uh, migrate uh, just over 28,000 uh, devices from, from our uh, uh, on-prem MDM tooling up to, up to cloud MDM tooling. That's awesome. Um, so you're done, right? <laughs> you've you've achieved you you've reached the top. Well, the, the garden is is planted. Everything is is you're done and dusted, right? You say that. I mean, uh, it's a journey, right? And you feel like you're on this climb, and um, you know, there's this vision, the light at the end of the tunnel, and we've we've kind of got there, right? But it doesn't end, right? You know, we're now in that period of refining, okay, and um, looking to roadmaps, and we have various different partners and integrations going on in the business. Um, obviously, WPP are, are a very uh, AI-forward company. You know, we have our own AI uh, platform as well that we really, really invest in. And so there's a real appetite in the business to pull and push, you know, on what, what more can we be doing? You know, what, what other opportunities? Um, and especially around device management, you know, the features and capabilities of, of, of Mac OS and how that helps our, our users, you know, to be their creative best selves, right? So as you know, Kanji introduced Kanji AI or Kai very recently. Yes. What do you... What is what is your thoughts about how you might be able to use yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, we're excited for this to come to our platform. Um, as I mentioned, we, we utilize AI a lot in our business and, and with our customers as well. But I think for us, we're, we're already looking at use cases um, around uh, AI on the platform. As I explained, we've got quite a large estate, so we have over 700 support engineers. Um, Se over 700 support engineers. Correct, with our current service provider. So um, the hope is, you know, in the first and second line support of those engineers, um, it could be a desire to maybe use Kai for them to do simple, you know, uh, uh, actions like recover a file vault key, for example, um, you know, just to interrogate a device or, um, another use case that's coming forward is a lot of our stakeholders are wanting information from, from our platform now. Now we've been able to centralize our devices and every device is attached to a user and we've got some great inserts and data coming from the platform. However, some of our stakeholders are not technical nor do they want to be, you know, logging into a device management system. So I think, you know, that uh, capability would really lend well in terms of just a stakeholder coming and say, hey, tell me how many devices I have you know, or how many, uh, how many of my users are using, you know, a certain application, for example. So I, th I see, you know, some great use cases just to be able to get some insights quite quickly for some of our stakeholders. Cool. What advice would you have for people in the audience about yeah. achieving what you've achieved? I think I would say, like, you know, the journey does feel like it's a mounting, right? There's so much that you've got to consider. Um, you know, the journey, selling that vision, being getting, getting that stakeholder, you know, input as well. Um, but what I will say is, like, when you get to where you wanted to be, right, it doesn't stop. There is continual growth as well. 
Um, it doesn't ever end. And I think the exciting part is, is when, once you've kind of built something, you know, it's that vision of like, well, where do we go next? Like, how do we refine this? How do we polish it up, you know? And for us, you know, a lot of, we get in a lot more requirements coming in from the business, um, you know, especially around our customer engagements. Um, you know, uh, we, you know we, uh, we're looking at uh, Vision Pro in our business at the moment. So that's caused a lot of excitement for um especially around our, our customer engagement and those immersive I experiences that's, that some of our opcos are trying to create with their customers. So we would say, um, you know, once, you know, kind of for us, it was kind of that, that climb, you got to the peak, but the peaks never come, right? Because you get to that kind of position of like, for us, like we've migrated all our devices, right? Well, that's not it now, <laughs> you know? The next step is, you know, is, you know, and I talk with excitement and passion because, you know, we're in a place where we're now looking to build more, right? You know, how can we be more smarter, automation? You know, how can we give, you know, what our clients and customers need and, you know, in terms of how they want to work as well? And that's always gonna be pulling and pushing at the business. Speaking of pulling and pushing, can you go into a little bit of detail of how to deal with the people who aren't on board, aren't, are not, not excited about the same thing you're excited about and giving you pushback? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I had a lot of that along the way. Um, and I think you have to find those common grounds, right? You know, um, I like to get really under the hood and, you know, really, you know, uh, in the weeds. And some people don't like to, but, the weeds. you know, <laughs> I have to get in there. And sometimes it's about, do we, you know, I kind of had this analogy, you know, it's your garden. Sometimes you have to go in there and kind of weed some stuff out, right, to let new stuff grow, okay? Just because, you know, you've had something or there's a specific tooling or operation, doesn't mean to say, like, that's set in stone. There's always life cycle around all of this, right? You know, and some, some, some of your objectives and requirements aren't, aren't met by certain tooling or certain solutions, and this is where we come in and kind of disrupt and look at, you know, what it is, is the desire and what we're trying to build those outcomes. Amazing. <laughs> Let me summarize what you've shared with us that I've heard. In your organization, Friction and blockers have built up over time. And people are not able to use their tools to do the amazing things that they do. They're super creative people. Yeah. You gathered your stakeholders and together built a vision for digital transformation. You built a vision of what could be. You evaluated tools and partners. You built a strategy and carried out that plan. You reacted to unexpected events along the way. You succeeded with the strategy, and people are using the technology in a way that was impossible before. You're never done. You've never, you reach a plateau, but there's always one more. You're constantly evaluating how you, can, how you can provide more capabilities for everyone at WPP to do their best work. Is there anything I missed? Um, no, I think that kind of summarizes everything. Um, I just, yeah, I think as well, which is important to say, none of this happens overnight, you know. This, this took us a few years to get to where we are. And I think having that kind of thought as well as you go along planning your strategy and everything, these things don't happen overnight. So you have to nurture, you know, feed it, <laughs> you know, bring people along for the ride. Some of those people disappear again, then you've got to get new stakeholders and kind of uh, new kind of uh, um, support in, in that vision, if you like. Um, but so, yeah, I think one of the biggest tips I would say is, is don't get in, impatient. These journeys do take time. Um, and it's worth taking that time as well uh, to get the desired outcomes, right? And as I talked about, you know, our plan and strategy changed very much over time as well. So you have to have that agility as well. Awesome. So our time is up. You're going to be here all week. I am, yes. Thank awesome. you for having me. And... We look forward to uh, playing some pool and shuffleboard with you all tonight. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having me.